this is downloaded from uh, my website uh, whose address has been given but just to be exact i just also paste it here on, under my website you should go to link 334-os uh, to get this downloaded and the process uh, business is critical because everything uh, running on your computer at a given time uh, is called a process so we will uh, understand how to create them, create them how to store them etc uh, and how to communicate between different processes so this will be a big coverage of your uh, course and you will also implement a programming assignment on this business uh, so that's why i decide to spare two uh, weeks on this issue this week is the first one and uh, next week i will still be talking about processes uh, the new parts of obviously uh, so let's just start with the introduction here where we uh, talk about the uh, computer uh, architecture slightly so we have the operating system code which is the kernel kernel code uh, that gets loaded into the memory when we start our computer so it is done by a firmware called bootstrap we have seen in the previous week uh, so it is a very tiny software that just puts the kernel into the memory but putting kernel into memory isn't enough obviously we need to put interesting programs into the memory so when a program is run it is brought from disk to memory so that program must be sitting on the disk at all times after all you have installed it uh, but sitting there is just a passive activity it becomes active when you double click on it or something uh, and at that time it is brought from disk to memory uh, and uh, and by program i mean the instructions of the program so if you look carefully a program is nothing but a set of instructions step-by-step -step instructions to perform something either to render a video to the screen or uh, talk with a server uh, to get some web page onto your browser etc so th these are all instructions uh, in the <clears throat> very lowest level okay so they come to the process uh, memory uh, and when you put a program from disk to memory now it becomes a process so process and program are different things related but different things uh, and once the once we have a process now then the central processing unit executes the process instructions uh, okay so cpu uh, CPU uh, is usually filled with the user mode, the user processes, but sometimes, from time to time, they uh, uh, the kernel code comes to the CPU. So at any given time, only one process is running in the CPU. It can be a user process and any of many user processes like chrome browser or your vlc media player etc uh, but sometimes uh, kernel code gets into the cpu like what happens for instance your user process is running running normally <clears throat> and it made a system call it wanted to communicate with a, a device for instance uh, so at that time uh, the kernel code comes in who knows how to talk with a device with that desired device and when it is uh, done it leaves the cpu and uh, in other words the system call finishes and i come back to my user processes other calls like probably non-system calls uh, so what we say here is user code may call an os routine uh, we will see more on the system calls uh, so 
basically it calls it to get a service done. Uh, <clears throat> so system calls are important because we don't want to touch the uh, uh, I/O code from uh, directly. Okay, so we may hurt the device if nothing. That's why we just rely on system calls and system calls uh, then talk with the uh, device drivers. Uh, so, okay, let's talk something about the system calls. Uh, it is basically uh, an interface to the services provided by the OS. So, for instance, let's take maybe the simplest call would be uh, the writes call, okay? R write something to the console, okay? In Windows, we the system call is write console, but in Unix-based systems, we just have this write system call but uh, again from your code here in main you don't really call the system call directly you actually use uh, the api uh, like printf in our case uh, which calls the system call right in the background uh, this write call is a very primitive call actually it it just accepts a set of bytes, okay? And then it knows how to talk with the video card uh, and it knows how to send those bytes to the video card and then video card uh, puts it into your screen. Uh, however, putting those bytes into the write function is a big deal. So this is not a very trivial thing. It, it can be done, but it is error prone. Uh, it is uh, very low level programming. Instead, what we do is we call printf function because we may want to print some number in scientific format, for instance. So in printf, we just do it by providing some percent uh, uh, and then uh, d for decimal, f for uh, real numbers and some formatting. So everything can be done with printf or in C++, you use C out. Uh, so they this function uh, in the background it creates those byte packets the package and then it calls right using that byte the, so it converts all this string here into a set of bytes uh, and preferably in a desired format like the scientific print format for instance uh, or other formats uh, and then uh, the system call write gets executed, which talks with the devices. So if we look here, the user mode is all about here, the upper side of this picture. Uh, and the user interacts with this API. Uh, uh, in this case, it is the standard C library. And the kernel code is basically doing the... Uh, uh, system calls like right in this case other system calls also exist like a process may want to create a different process okay uh, in this case we fork uh, so uh, we call this fork in unix and just uh, create process in uh, windows uh, but this is a very important pro uh, procedure we will talk more on the fork issue today and next week. Uh, so a process may want to exit or may want to wait for another process. Then these system calls are at your disposal. Or you can do some file manipulation. In that case, uh, open, read, write and close will be your system calls. But again, you don't just call read directly. Instead, maybe you use fcanf, okay, which is coming in your C library, with your C library. So uh, here, uh, why do we use uh, application programming interface APIs rather than system calls directly? So I have talked a little bit on this already. System calls expect some special bytes-based parameters and just creating those bytes is a very uh, error-prone and difficult thing. So we 
use the API and API handles the byte conversion for us. But there are also other reasons. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so in the user code, I am using my API, graphics API, OpenGL or C library, like for uh, printf that stuff. Uh, and then in the kernel level, we have the system calls uh, and API to uh, enable that system calls, it may use in the background some machine instructions, some register setting, etc. We don't really want to deal with them. We just talk with our API directly. Uh, so these were about system calls. These are the calls within the kernel code that are low level calls. They don't have to talk with other devices. Uh, system programs are some uh, applications that are calling system calls, like copy. Uh, you copy paste something, some a file from one location to other. So in that scenario, you are basically uh, writing stuff to the disk. Uh, and other system programs can be renaming, uh, finding stuff with grep or some network protocols, etc. <clears throat> now let's come to the process business uh, more clearly. Uh, it is a program in execution, and a program is basically a piece of code, uh, and it's a passive active entity. Process is active on the other end, uh, and the program becomes a process when executable file is loaded into the memory into memory from disk. So in C, we can see the active processes here using our task manager. Uh, in Unix, we can see them from terminal using uh, commands like top or ps3. Uh, once we have a lot of processes in our system, which is usually the case, because we are all with the multitasking environments these days, we need to schedule them. So which one will use the CPU and when and for how long? We need to create a new process. So in Unix, for instance, everything begins with a process called init. Uh, and that process initializes, uh, starts, creates other processes. So without that process, you wouldn't be able to uh, create other processes. Uh, once you have a lot of processes running, uh, they may be accessing the same shared variable. They may, so it needs some synchronization. They may need to communicate, exchange ideas, ex exchange data, and then with synchronization, uh, deadlock issue may come to the picture. So uh, everything will be handled uh, by the operating system and we will actually learn them how to learn how to handle them. Uh, so a process, what resources does a given process need? Obviously it needs a CPU to get executed. It needs a memory to be stored, the instructions. Uh, <clears throat> and sometimes, so this is not always, but sometimes it needs some IO input output, for instance, to get some value from keyboard. But there are some processes called batch processes that are totally CPU bound, so they don't do I/O at all, uh, which we will come later. Uh, also, sometimes again, this is also optional. Uh, some processes may want to talk with files, in which case you need some disk I/O. Uh, you need to talk with disk. So I am talking about bringing process from disk to memory. So what is that business? So let's get into details here. Uh, we have a process which is a running application uh, and a process has an address space. Okay. Uh, and there is a logic here. Uh, hence it is called the logical addresses. The logic is the following. We have, we have a consecutive set of bytes reserved for a given process. Uh, and in the very beginning, we have the instructions 
of that is making this process. And on top of that, once the instructions are done, we put the data that the process is going to use, like the global variables. And also, this process is likely to call functions, and we need a stack to keep track of the function parameters and then where to return after a function terminates. So stack is going to be in your address as well. As well. So this is a consecutive set of bytes for your process in memory. But actually, uh, the operating system maps this logical space into the physical address space. And we will talk more on this in the memory manager part of this course, like uh, in a month or so. Uh, but currently, you should understand that this is just a, an abstract view. Uh, but in reality, this memory space, the logical address space, is mapped uh, not necessarily consecutively to the physical memory, <clears throat> physical address space. So let's talk more about this logical address space. So this text is this uh, program code, the instructions, basically. Uh, and OK, I may have a lot of number of, a, a great number of uh, lines of code. I, I may have a lot of instructions. So And this process is coming to CPU, and sometimes it is going outside the CPU and then resumes. So to make the resume possible, I also need this PC, which is basically a register that points to the current line of execution. On top of that, we have the data part where I save the global variables that are initiated and stored when I start the pro process. Now remember, the local variables are uh, created during uh, as the when I hit to the declaration point uh, within the function, but global variables, they just uh, start immediately once you start the program and they stay within the program at all times until it finishes. Uh, and the heap is like the array-based stuff when you allocate memory, uh, like to store one million elements, then this heap grows. Uh, and stack, uh, is uh, the temporary data, uh, which again grows as I call more functions because function parameters need to be stored and also return address. So you finish some function, where do I return now? I return to the most recent function that has called me. That's why I need a stack logic here. Uh, yeah, so this is a process in memory and uh, so le let's uh, talk about this stack part here. Let me extend it a little bit. Uh, basically, it is called runtime stack, not just a stack. And uh, what it does is uh, it keeps a chain of active functions uh, and uh, so when a function is called, uh, the runtime system pushes on the stack a frame, this green frame. And within this frame, I have the uh, local variables like i for the main and k for the foo, etc. Uh, and also the return value. Uh, so for instance, I come to this bar function which is currently on top of my stack because I am executing the bar function. But when it finishes, I just pop it out and I return to the foo function, which has called bar. So I don't just return from bar to main directly. There is this foo to be handled. Uh, so, and there is this very popular term, stack overflow. So it comes from the following, uh, as you, uh, during the execution, as you call a function, you create this activation record, this screen frame, uh, frames, uh, and they get pushed to your stack, runtime stack. And if you push a lot of them, at some point, it will overflow. And your process just uh, crashes because this stack part just overgrows and it uh, probably 
occupies and overshoots your available logical address space. And it gets observed a lot, especially in the recursive calls, because these are rather hard to uh, keep track of. Sometimes if you forget your base uh, statement, for instance, or if you do uh, some error, uh, it is more likely uh, for you to do a function call error during recursion rather than doing uh, easy iterative calls. So uh, here in this example, I write down a simple recursive function to compute a factorial of n and zero factorial is one. So I know this. Uh, so this is the base case. However, for a general case to get n factorial, you need to multiply n with the result of fact n minus one, which is basically the recursive call. So in this scenario, what happens is, uh, for instance, three factorial calls, three comes here, it calls two factorial, and then two factorial is unknown, so it calls one factorial, one factorial, which is fact one, is still unknown, so it calls fact zero, and finally, fact zero is well defined, so it returns one. But now, so it gets a little messy. Then where will I return? So I need I keep all this information in a stack, okay? Uh, and then everything is quite logical. So if the first call creates this activation record with fact uh, three here, and it calls fact two, which is this box, and it calls fact one, which is this box, and fact one calls fact zero, which is this box. And this calls nothing else because I know the answer, which is one. So I pop this out and come, be come back to this top element, which is fact one. Okay. And fact one, knowing the answer one, it completes its answer, which is also one, because one times one is one. Uh, and from here, it gives this answer of one to do fact two process not process the activation record and fact two knowing learning its answer as number two it returns it that two to fact three and fact three eventually uh, now it knows the value of fact two which is the red two uh, so it hits it with itself three three times two is six so in this case there wasn't any overflow everything was within the boundaries so this is uh, how a process keeps track of its function calls. Now, if we come back to our uh, discussion of uh, uh, operating system, uh, so a process will eventually need some variables to play with. So let's see at a low level, how does a variable migrate from the initial place, which is disk, to the register? Uh, so, uh, in this picture, as you go from left to right, you will see uh, the decrease in storage capability, uh, like here on the register level, typically you have, you can store one kilobyte of data in, in a given register, whereas you can store 100 gigabyte of data in a given disk. Uh, and you do a magnetic storage in a disk, whereas in a register, you do memory-based storages, uh, which is uh, volatile, whereas this one is non-volatile, so it stays there. Uh, and the speed increases as I go from left to right, the access speed. Uh, you can access the variable in a register in like 0 0.2 nanoseconds, and for a disk, you need to open a file to go to disk. So there is this file abstraction. You need to go to the correct sector in your cylinder, etc. So it takes quite a time to get a variable uh, from disk into your program variable. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so th this is in general the migration. Uh, of something from disk to register. Uh, and now, uh, the process execution. Uh, 
Uh, so we now get a clear understanding of how does a CPU handle a given process. Uh, basically, a process goes through different states uh, and uh, operating system actually decides these states, not the CPU. And CPU becomes active at some particular states. In in particular, at the running state, CPU is active. And on, on all other states, CPU isn't active. On other states, uh, the process is sitting in the memory waiting its turn. Or, uh, yes, yeah, still sitting in some queue waiting its I.O. device. So le let's understand this slide better uh, now. Operating system makes this happen, makes what happen? Uh, several processes running on one CPU, okay? So there will be a sharing and operating system is the coordinator. It enables fair sharing or fair scheduling. Also, it uh, protects a process to modify other processes. Uh, so, to make this done, we uh, separate processes into different states, and I think it will be better understood using this uh, picture. A state can be a new, uh, so a process can be at the new state. So basically, in this state, it, it just gets an ID, a unique ID, uh, and then goes to the ready mode, meaning that I am ready to run. So, if the scheduler allows you to run, then you go to your running state. And as you are running, running, you may finish, like come to the last line of your main function, then you are a terminated state. Or during the execution, you hit your exit call, the system call exit. Uh, you call that system call from your user code uh, with some parameter. Uh, and you get terminated, okay? But this happens uh, less frequently because these are just final events. But in general, as you are running, you may get a, uh, an IO interrupt, for instance. So, for instance, you reach the F, uh, scanf, scanf line. In that scenario, you go to your waiting queue and you may wait your maybe minutes or hours or nanoseconds it is totally I.O. dependent. So if you are waiting for a keyboard uh, input, then you are at the mercy of your uh, user, the human being. Whenever he or she hits the enter key, now you escape from the waiting state and now you go to the ready state. You don't just come back to the running immediately because other actions are being happening. So you have to wait your turn. You go from wait to ready never from wait to running. Uh, so the IO is like that. Or event wait, so what can be the event? It, event can be the click of a mouse, or the printer is released, or you are going to wait for the closing of a file, so file operations. So some something will put you to the waiting mode, and after the waiting, you go to the ready. And again, during the ready state, you can go to the running mode only with the permission of the scheduler operating system. And uh, during the running, you can get uh, an interrupt. So what is this interrupt? This interrupt is basically uh, telling that your time is up. Like, I interrupt you. I want... I kick you out of the CPU and put you back to the ready queue. I don't put you back to the waiting queue because you don't wait anything. You were just running regularly like you are the owner of the world. But operating system says that you are not the owner of the world, owner of the CPU. You just get interrupted and you leave the CPU and go to your ready state. Eventually, with a fair scheduler especially, you will come back to your running state. <clears throat> okay, so these are the states. Uh, Hojam, I have a question. So this interrupt uh, schedule cycle is happening like very, very fast, like yes. constantly. Uh -huh. 
very fast. Uh -huh. So, for uh, example, in one second, it might give you know, to Chrome to I don't know to other uh, program, uh -huh. so that they yeah. share resources uh, equally. Yes. Uh, uh, nowadays, we have, as you know, quad CPUs or eight of them, four of them. Uh, so uh, those ones can be used in parallel, uh, but uh, obviously they. Uh, there is a range about the number of resources. Eventually, you have to do this interruption because uh, the CPU will generally number of CPUs will be less than the number of processes. And in that scenario, uh, operating system uses some timing. It is not a second. It is way less than a second. So this action happens uh, in nanosecond levels. Uh, but uh, so you don't even realize it is happening, but it is actually happening. Uh, okay, so there is uh, the there isn't a certain fixed time. So depending on the application behavior, operating system may change that time, but it is typically uh, in the nanosecond levels. Uh, I Thank you, John. Yes, uh, and so. Processes, uh, when they are in the memory, so not in the CPU, I represent a process in the memory uh, using this process control block, which stores the ID of the process, the unique ID, uh, the user who is running the process, and more importantly, the state of the process, uh, like is it ready or waiting? And so this is also very important where am I in that process? So I was running here and maybe at line 736, I got out of the CPU. So then this PC is equal to 767. So I will resume from that line. And obviously I have made, I have been making some computations. I need to store them at the CPU registers. Uh, so those values, need to be remembered so that I will roll, reload them to the CPU registers once I am back in the CPU. Uh, and some other metadata, like uh, is it a priority, pr prior process uh, or uh, some bookkeeping, so what is the total CPU time? So maybe depending on this data, scheduler may update its algorithm, etc. So here is another way to look at the PCB content where I am just showing some of the stuff like the registers, calculations until the interrupt are stored here so that I can resume using those registers, some uh, state and PC. So these are all in your control block. And this term is very important, context switch. It is the action of uh, leaving the CPU and uh, putting something else to the CPU instead. So I am switching the context of the CPU. So in this example, for instance, uh, P0 is running and here it gets interrupted. Okay, so maybe its time is up or something else has happened, like uh, it, it has. Uh, divided by zero or something, so uh, CPU doesn't know how to handle it, so it uh, creates uh, an exception and leaves it out of the CPU until some action is done about that. But in general, let's consider the time interrupt where uh, I just get out of the CPU. But this is the idle time, be careful. So this is the overhead. I am doing nothing. So this is a cost um, which doesn't contribute to the progress or the outcome of my activity. So this, my activity is about P0, but here I am doing nothing about P0. I am just saving its state uh, to the PCB. Uh, so basically this is a struct in C, okay? So it is basically a C pro program little struct. Uh, so I am putting them onto that struct uh, and 
this isn't even enough, then I reload the state of a different process. So uh, scheduler tells me to load P1, okay. Then I go here and uh, ask P1 to come in. And th this reloading is also taking some time. So this is a non-idle time, wonderful. I am doing some tests. And here I get interrupted. And so I say my current state because my PC has advanced program counter, my registers have been updated. So I need to save it in my control block. And then uh, what happens is uh, I uh, am again in, a, uh, in an idle state and idle in terms of doing nothing for the process, neither P1 nor P0. I am doing something, but at a kernel level. I am just saving stuff in my kernel memory where there is a special memory for this PCB in my kernel memory, uh, the memory reserved for the kernel code. Okay, so as you can see, doing a lot of context switches will increase this idle time, so I should avoid it. But on the other end, doing less amount of context switches is still dangerous because then P1 will never be running, for instance. So there is a nice trade-off here. New uh, operating system needs to be careful about this. Uh, and context switch is a kernel code. So this part saving stuff to the kernel, uh, to the PCB, which is basically a kernel code entity uh, and re reloading it. So it's a kernel code, the red part where the context switch happens, meaning that kernel code comes to the CPU and it is just making this saving happen, happen. And process is a user code. And so let's talk more about the context switch here. The overhead, which is the idle time, uh, in this Ubuntu uh, from 10 years ago, about, because this is like, 2009, April 904. So this is a very old information, but it may it still gives an idea. So it is about five uh, microseconds, uh, which corresponds to like 10,000 cycles. But 10,000 cycle doesn't make one instruction, uh, especially in this architecture. Cycle per instruction is like four because uh, loading takes five cycles, so uh, branching three cycles, etc. So, if you look at the average cycle to handle one single instruction, it is like four. So, you need to divide this number by four, then uh, it will still give some uh, big amount, like in this case, it's like 4,000. CPU cycle is just going as an overhead for the context switch. Hmm. Okay, so this is the PCB, by the way, in the kernel code. Um, so this is something from the kernel code, maybe the first kernel code you see. This is in Linux or Unix operating systems, Unix-based systems. We have this struct of C, and we can see here that Unix is written in C. Uh, and uh, it is the PCB is called task struct. It has this process ID, the timing information, the open files due to this process, etc. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this code fits into the memory reserved for the kernel. Okay. Uh, so I will talk, so let's give a 10 minutes break at this point and in the uh, return we will talk something about process scheduling, about the failure schedule stuff. So there will be a different section, chapter on the scheduling issue, we will spend a week here, but here I will just give some idea and then I will begin with the process creation part, which is the coding part of today. Uh, so, okay, see you in 10. Yeah.